All right, my friend, welcome back. This is part two of the top 10 cognitive distortions that cause depression and anxiety. So if you didn't catch part one and you're wondering what those first five were, make sure to hit the pause button, go check out that video, and then come dive into this one. I also just want to remind you to stick around to the end if you want to see how good you are at recognizing when cognitive distortions and thought errors pop up. We're going to play a little game called Spot the Distortion, and we're going to test your skills. So in the previous video, we went through the first five cognitive distortions. And if you don't remember what these were, they were all or nothing thinking, overgeneralization, labeling, mental filtering, and discounting the positive. And so cognitive distortion number six that I need you to know about is blame. And there are two types of blame, okay? Self-blame is when you find fault in yourself. And other blame is when you find it in others. Pretty self-explanatory, right? But here's the tricky part. Regardless of which direction you point that blame, you're not actually identifying or solving the true problem at hand. When you're stuck in the blame game, you get caught up in a cycle where you feel like crap internally, right? Because you're telling yourself that you're no good or you're getting pissed off at someone else because you're thinking that they're no good. All of your energy just gets sucked up into this blame vortex and nothing productive actually gets accomplished. And then we just end up resenting ourselves or the people around us. So the goal with blame instead is to acknowledge this whole idea of shared responsibility. Because as you probably already know, rarely any outcome is the result of one person's actions. And instead of getting caught up in this never-ending debate of who's responsible for what, right? I don't know about you, but I personally like to actually get shit done. And so whenever I find myself stuck in this blame spiral, I try to shift my mindset from blame to problem solving, okay? Because this way I can channel my energy into figuring out solutions and even potentially learning from past mistakes. Now, cognitive distortion number seven is called jumping to conclusions. And this is when you make quick judgments or predictions about a situation without having sufficient evidence, right? What we do is we jump to conclusions that aren't always supported by facts. And so there are two different ways that we can do this. And the first one is by mind reading. And this is when you assume that you know what other people are thinking or feeling. And the other way is by fortune telling. And this is when you predict negative outcomes without any factual support. So I want to give you an example of this. The other day I was working and my husband had the day off. And let me tell you, it was a day, okay? I had appointment after appointment and it seemed like each kid I was seeing and treating was progressively worse off than the prior one. And I never even had the opportunity to leave my office and take a break. It was seriously to the point where it was hard to even find the time to get up to go pee. But here's the thing. I was in a good flow state, and despite the heaviness of what I was trying to deal with, I wasn't getting worn down or tired by it. I just barreled through and I did what I had to do, right? I was trying to help as best as I could, and the dynamics were what they were. But because my husband never saw me leave my office, he assumed that my day was really hard and that I'd be in a grumpy mood. And later in the evening, he told me, that he thought I was mad at him that whole day because he was relaxing on his day off instead of doing shit around the house to help me. Here's a joke, though. That thought never crossed my mind once while I was working. And truth be told, I was in the zone. I was doing my thing. Him not doing things around the house wasn't even on my radar. And when I finished up that day and I finally left the office, I was ready to go have fun with my boys. I mean, okay, let's be truthful, right? I was probably debating my head what we were going to eat for dinner, and I was definitely needing to pee. But you get the point I'm trying to make. All of this just shows how our minds can play tricks on us and how we can come up with these outrageous thoughts that are completely off base. Rob crafted this story in his head on how I felt and mentally prepared ahead of time for the conflict that maybe was going to occur between us later in the day. And we do this all the time. We're all guilty of it, especially when it comes to our relationships. We go throughout our day acting like we have some magical crystal ball that makes us believe that we know better than you do and how you're feeling and what you're thinking. It's shit like this that leads us to feeling hopeless because we tell ourselves that things will always be bad, things will never change, they'll never get better, and we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. We end up convinced that we're stuck in this problem forever, and that belief becomes a powerful, powerful barrier to change. Because why try if it's always going to be like this? So jumping to conclusions essentially traps us in a crappy situation 
And it locks us into a fixed mindset where we convince ourselves that change is impossible. The truth is that breaking free from these cycles starts with challenging your assumptions. Do you know what I told my husband to do the next time he thinks he knows what I'm thinking? Ask. Seriously, just ask. Test out that theory. Check out the accuracy of your assumptions. And if you don't have the courage in the moment to do it with the person you're with, check the evidence around you for your beliefs. Ask yourself, is there concrete evidence to support these predictions? What other reasons might explain this person's behaviors? What is something positive that could occur from the situation? Take back control over your thinking and don't just go with your first knee-jerk reaction. All right, so cognitive distortion number eight is referred to as magnification and minimization. So magnification is when you exaggerate the negativity of a situation and blow things out of proportion. And another term commonly used for this and something you've probably heard before is catastrophizing. And what we do is we turn small problems into monumental disasters. And so minimization is pretty much the opposite of this. It's when you dismiss the significance of things. So it might be different events, achievements, or positive aspects about yourself. And what we do is we shrink the importance of things and we downplay them. And so I see this all the time in my clinic, especially when working with teenagers. I'll ask them how things have been going and they'll give me the classic answer of fine. And what happens next is I bring in their parents who then proceed to tell me that they just got arrested or kicked out of school or something outrageous, right? With this example, you can see how they minimize their well-being to me. Their replies are unclear. They're nonspecific. And so when I talk to them, I don't get a complete picture of all the details. And I have no clue about what the hell is actually going on. So if I want a better representation of what's actually happening, I need to get more information. So from a parent, a teacher, their therapist, whoever. So there's an idea out there that a lot of people find helpful when it comes to better understanding the idea of magnification and minimization. And it's the idea of the binocular trick. When we magnify events, it's like looking through binoculars and zooming in on the negative aspects. It makes them appear larger and more significant than they really are. Then on the flip side, when we minimize, it's like looking through the opposite end of those binoculars. It makes everything smaller and we diminish the importance or the significance of things. So the goal is to really adjust the focus of your mental binoculars. So when things feel too big, try to zoom out and gain a broader perspective. And then when things feel too insignificant or too small, zoom in to recognize and try to appreciate the positives and find gratitude in what's important. The key is to try to get a balanced view. Now on to cognitive distortion number nine, which is emotional reasoning. And this involves reasoning from the way you feel. So examples of this would be, I feel guilty, so I must have done something wrong. I feel anxious, so something terrible is bound to happen. I feel like shit about myself, so others must be judging me too. What happens is we find ourselves interpreting events, making decisions, or evaluating situations based on our emotional state rather than based on what's actually happening. Now, if you remember from my past episodes, the whole idea behind thought work is that you feel the way you think. And when you're feeling like shit, it's often because your thoughts are twisted or distorted. And therefore, your feelings don't accurately reflect the reality and the facts of what's going on. Some people compare this to the curved mirrors you see at amusement parks and fun houses. Just as they distort the reflections of reality, emotional reasoning distorts the perceptions of events and circumstances based on your emotional state rather than objective evidence. This is where the quote, if you can change the way you think, you can change the way you feel, holds a lot of importance. By being able to recognize and challenge distorted thought patterns, you can actively work to change your emotional responses. And that's the whole point of learning and having awareness of these thought errors and cognitive distortions. All right, my friend, you made it to cognitive distortion number 10, should statements. And this is when you set rigid and unrealistic expectations or rules about how you, others, or the world should be. And it's not just the shoulds that you want to watch out for. This also pops up when we use words such as must, ought to, need to, shouldn't, and have to. And what we see is that these sort of statements just wreck our emotions. Those self-directed shoulds bring up feelings of guilt and self-criticism because we're imposing perfectionism on ourselves. 
And then when we target the should statements at others or even the world in general, it often brings up feelings such as frustration and anger, maybe even some disappointment and resentment. And then if that's not enough, there's also hidden should statements to watch out for. And this is when we don't explicitly verbalize the shoulds or the musts in our statements, but they're implied. And a lot of the times we're not even fully aware of them when we say it. So let me give you an example of this. Say you're at the park with your kids and you see another family there and you think to yourself, wow, those parents, they really have some well-behaved kids. While we aren't completely shooting all over ourselves here, there's the hidden implication that we should be able to effortly manage our kids all the time and we should be better parents. And it's essentially this unspoken standard that we put on ourselves to be better than we are. Now, just like with the other cognitive distortions, step one is to try to recognize these statements in the moment. If we can, we give ourselves a better chance of being more flexible with our thinking. One of my favorite techniques for challenging these thoughts is to substitute the should statement for a more balanced one. So instead of saying, I need to get this right, or I should be perfect, I'll substitute should or need with the word prefer. So instead I'll say something like, I'd prefer to get this right or I'd prefer to do well. You see how that just lands a little bit differently? This then opens up the door to adding another tool and piggybacking off the substitution technique. I call it the comma but technique. So after you make your prefer statement, you then add to that comma but, and then you finish the sentence. So this is what it would look like. I prefer to get this right, comma but, it's okay if I make mistakes. You see how changing the verbiage takes the pressure out of the original statement? I should get this right just sounds harsh. I'd prefer to get this right, but it's okay if I make mistakes. It allows you to be more human. All right, my friend, those are the last of the cognitive distortions that make up the top 10 cognitive distortions that cause depression and anxiety. So to recap, the top 10 distortions are one, all or nothing thinking, two, overgeneralization, three, labeling, four, mental filtering, five, discounting the positive, six, blame, seven, jumping to conclusions, eight, magnification and minimization, nine, emotional reasoning, and 10, should statements. So now that we have the full list of cognitive distortions broken down, I want to test you on how well you can pick these out. We're going to play a little game that I like to call spot the distortion. The way it works is that I'm going to read you an interaction that occurs between two people. And I want you to try to pick out and write down these distortions as you hear them. All right, so here's the scenario. I want you to imagine that a doctor has completed a mental health evaluation on a patient. And they're talking to them about their diagnoses and treatment options. The doctor states, Mr. Smith, based on our discussion, I believe you might be struggling with major depression. I'm really concerned about how low your mood has been over the past couple of months and your lack of interest in activities. I'd really like to talk more about therapy options with you so we can get you feeling better. The patient then goes on to say, well, isn't this just typical for me? I've been feeling a bit down lately, and now you're saying I'm a depressed person? I've always known that I haven't had any luck in life, and this is just the cherry on top. No one will ever want to be around someone like me. And to be honest, there's no point in doing therapy, doc. I'll never be happy again, and all the therapists I've seen before have sucked. So no, I'm not interested. And yet again, telling another person who doesn't know anything about me all of my problems in life. All right, now it's your turn. I want you to list out the distortions. If you need to, rewind this, listen to it again, and write them down before you hear my thoughts about this example. So I actually hear these types of comments all the time in clinic. And I think I can make an argument for all 10 types of cognitive distortions here. Let's start at the top and work our way down. The first is all or nothing thinking. And this was demonstrated when the patient said, now I'm a depressed person, and I've always known I haven't had any luck in life. He's essentially believing that people are either depressed or not depressed, or they're either lucky or unlucky in life. Next up is overgeneralization, and this pops up when he states that he'll never be happy again. He's taking this one moment in time and extrapolating it over his entire life. And just because he's depressed now, he's implying that he'll be depressed forever. So next up is labeling, and this occurs in the situation when he calls himself a depressed person. And this is actually one of my pet peeves. I really find it bothersome when people identify with their diagnoses and they make it part of their identity. And unfortunately, I hear it all the time. 
So mental filtering and discounting the positive are next up on the list. We see this when he talks about himself not having any luck in life, when he states that there's no point in doing therapy, and when he says that he'll never be happy again. He's looking through those shit-tinted glasses and only seeing the negatives. He's then discounting any time in his life where he's had good experiences, whether it be his life in general or with prior therapists, not to mention any positive qualities he does have as well. Blame is the next distortion, and this one's a little more tricky. He doesn't flat out state that he's at fault, but just the way he talks makes it seem implied. He also has this life isn't fair vibe going on where he might be pointing the finger at life in general. This is definitely not as clear and straightforward as the other ones, but I think you could make an argument for it. If you asked him if he's blaming himself for his symptoms, I wouldn't be surprised if he said yes. Now on to jumping to conclusions, which we see a lot here. He does this when he states that no one will want to be around him and when he says that there's no point in doing therapy. Magnification and minimization are up next, and I feel like his whole response back to the doctor essentially magnifies his diagnosis and all his prior failures, and he definitely minimizes any good traits or qualities he might have. Emotional reasoning pops up because he has this pervasive belief that because I feel depressed, I'll always be depressed. And then lastly, there are a lot of hidden and implied shoulds here. He should be lucky in life. He shouldn't be feeling this way. He should be someone who people want to hang around. Therapy should have worked for him in the past. Now, how many of these did you pick up on? Were there any examples that you had that maybe I didn't? Drop a comment and let me know. I want to know how you did and if you had any questions. I really hope you found learning about these top 10 cognitive distortions to be helpful. Because when viewing anxiety or depression from the cognitive framework, the basic idea is that you feel the way you think. And when you're feeling like shit, it's always because your thoughts are twisted and distorted. And when you can change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. The most important thing to remember is that you might not be able to control your first thought, but you sure as hell can control your second one. So my task for you is to protect the thoughts that you let into your emotional home. When that first negative thought comes knocking on your front door, crack it open a little bit, maybe examine who's there, and if it's something or someone that you don't like, shut that damn door. And if it's an unwanted intruder who gets in, kick them the hell out. Now that's what I have for you today. If you found value in this video, make sure to share it with someone you know. Talk soon, my friend. Until then, keep kicking ass and crushing it.